Square is very deep into the culture of Japan. Originally a spin-off from Masafumi Miyamoto's father's powerline construction firm, for over 30 years its games have helped power the rise of Japanese games development. There are no shortage of games that live under the Square Enix banner, but none as big as Final Fantasy. From our Western perspective, there's an air of mythos around the company. The accepted truth behind the series' title is that it was named Final Fantasy as it was Square's make-or-break game to avoid impending bankruptcy. And even if the real answer has more to do with creating an acronym that could be pronounced by both Eastern and Western audiences, <laughs> it's that first Interesting. story that gets told. That's the legacy of this series. Wait, okay, so he says Final Fantasy was named that way to deal with bankruptcy, but I mean, didn't hadn't they already named it that before Final Fantasy fourteen needed to be remade? I don't know if I understood that. It was already because Final Fantasy itself has been around for hasn't it been around for more than thirty years? The the first the very first Final Fantasy one. Oh, it's the make or break game. What had Square Enix done before that? What other games before Final Fantasy 1? Oh, was that the very first game? Squaresoft. Rad Racer. They were just Squaresoft. Interesting. Okay. I'm learning everything today. Stories about adventures that get passed from generation to generation. As nearby as the arcades of Akihabara and as far as the playgrounds of Europe. As the Final Fantasy series has moved from numeral to numeral, there have been high points and low. But with each new game comes the promise of a new story, a new myth. The story of what happened with Final Fantasy XIV is one such myth. What we know about it comes from old reviews, archived message board threads, and through conversations with those who were there. The reason for this is that the original version of Final Fantasy XIV doesn't exist anymore. Unlike the va Who is a legacy player? Raise your hand. It's very quiet. Okay. It's because I turned it down because it was loud before. As majority of other old games, there is no way of playing it. It was redacted, painted over. Where once stood a game that threatened to sink the Final Fantasy brand forever, now stands the second most popular subscription MMO in the world. And as the years pass us, the myth of that original version and its incredible redemption story are at risk of disappearing. How did it all happen? How did the same studio that shipped a broken mess turn it all around in two years? Why did they make the decision to keep the old version still alive while secretly working on a brand new game? And how did they manage to make all of this, the redesign and rebirth, part of the game's lore? We knew this was a story worth telling, not only for those who were there to see it all go down, but for the millions of you who have never heard about this, who never knew the extraordinary lengths the development team went to to save this game. So we did just that. Pack your bags, friends. No clip is heading to Tokyo. Whee!
Hello and welcome to Shinjuku Tokyo, home of Godzilla, restaurants full of dancing robots, and Square Enix, one of the most prolific video game companies in the world. For the past few months I've been playing catch up with this story, playing the latest version of the game, talking to players, and watching community retrospective series like the Speakers Network's fantastic fall and rise of Final Fantasy XIV. My goal, to make sure we asked the right questions when we sat down with the team. During our time here in Shinjuku, we're going to talk to everyone from the engineers who worked on the original game, to localization leads, community managers, and even the CEO of the company. All to allow them the opportunity to tell their side of this fascinating story. The fall and rise of Final Fantasy XIV happened in real time in front of millions of people around the world. But we wanted to know about this story from an entirely new perspective, from inside the corporate machine that made it happen, that led to its terrible launch and ultimately its incredible rebirth. My name is uh, Michael Christopher Koji Fonx. Um, I am the English localization lead for Final Fantasy XIV. My middle name. When I met Koji, um, I didn't know who he was, and it was when I went to Tokyo the first time last year. And um, he came up to me in the hall backstage of the first rehearsal, like in my dressing room. I think someone knocked on my door, and I was just kind of preparing myself the first time I'm singing these songs live with an orchestra, you know, I was just kind of like trying to get into the headspace and then I get a knock on the door and one of my representatives is like, there's someone here to, to speak to you and it was Koji and I had no idea who he was and I I didn't, I, I, I can't remember if he introduced himself to me right away or if it kind of came up during the conversation that he was having because he said that he was super excited to see me and meet me and then yes and then I learned that he had written um, tomorrow and tomorrow and some of the other songs that I were singing on that and he was just so sweet and and so excited to meet me and then after the rehearsal was over uh, he came back and talked to me again and he was even more excited and and I think he said that he teared up hearing hearing it sung live for the first time and then he and I just immediately we just like went into conversation for 20 30 minutes and it was funny because me and Jason needed to be in the same um taxi to get back to the hotel and they were waiting for me to be done speaking with Koji but of course because people are very respectful they weren't going to interrupt us so Jason poor Jason was literally waiting around for like 30 40 minutes after they had initially first called the taxi for me and Koji to just stop yammering at each other in the halls it was super super sweet <laughs> I love him I'm being Koji it's not something I gave myself it's a, a name my father gave me my father was stationed uh, in Japan for two years in the Navy when he was young oh. went back to the States my mom had me um, they wanted to give me a Japanese name. The family was having none of that. Oh, that's so cool. I just assumed that he gave himself the name Koji, but wow. Okay, so the Japanese culture runs deep with his family. That. <laughs> so they kind of snuck it in the middle name, but then they always called me Koji. And right. so I guess the go you know the joke was on the rest of the family. You know, my dad mm -hmm. being in the navy didn't really learn a lot about Japan other than he really liked Japan, but didn't learn any of the language. So I always knew that. My name was Japanese, but beyond that, I really didn't know anything about Japan. But there was always that little seed in there. And then when I got into high school, there's a Japanese class, and I like games. Oh, they make games in Japan. They let me study Japanese. If I study mm. Japanese, I can play all those cool Japanese games that, I, that never come out over in America. And it kind of just snowballed from there. Uh, when I graduated from high school, um, I took a trip to Japan for three weeks, homestay type of thing, and I fell in love with it. And during that, period I got to visit a lot of schools um, and a lot of English classes in those schools and I thought wow I could probably do I know English I could do this it'll be easy um, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be but I studied a couple years at a, at a university in America then transferred over to Japan started over four years at a university in Japan wow. Wow. got my teaching license and uh, yeah it's hard work being a teacher yes I, I mean i loved it but i mean it was very draining and that's why pretty much after you'd go to school six in the morning for morning basketball practice because i was the basketball coach because that's my she principal said hey you're coach. tall you're the basketball coach <laughs> then you'd get into classes 
I mean, I'd have my homeroom class, then I'd have... That's funny because I, I'm pretty sure Koji, in, in one of our many conversations, has said that he's not a very athletic person. So imagining him being the basketball coach in Japan because he's tall. <laughs> Uh, so silly. Of you know, six or seven other classes teaching, then you'd have after school, all of a sudden it's, oh, there's after school basketball, and then you'd get home and you'd correct. So I was really, you know, always at school every day. It was very draining, and I would go Tall home is and good. <laughs> I would play FF11. It was how I was able to relax, and being able to go into my little room and turn off the lights and put on my headphones and, you know, get into that world of Vanadio was something that helped me escape mm. from the stress, and then it just happened to be, you know, one day I was online, you know, checking for 11 related information, and I saw that Square Enix was hiring, looking for a translator, and it just kind of, wow, that would be really cool. Whoa. Everything aligned. Koji wasn't alone. That's Final so Fantasy XIV cool. was launched in 2010, but the story of this game starts eight years earlier with the launch of Final Fantasy XI, Square's first them. MMO, the early days of online. Many of the team who worked on XIV started. Oh, so XI was the first MMO. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything. I'm going to learn so much today. <laughs> you have XI related trauma. Koji took a shot and landed a payoff. Bid on 11. Yeah. One of those was Kasuga-san, who joined the company in 1999 to build a network infrastructure for this fledgling MMO. そう、自分 プレイステーション2でネットワークを作るためにまあ、まあ、あの、<笑> ドラマ、だ、今週まげでやるなんて Eleven was my first MMO. I hadn't played one before. I remember purchasing the PlayStation 2 broadband unit because they were all sold out. I ended up paying double on like some Yahoo auction or something <laughs> like that. Ridiculous, but I had to play it. We got a new internet connection. We were on a regular modem at that mm -hmm. time, but because you know, we needed, we needed a new modem, we had to upgrade to ISDN 128, you know? But yeah, it was definitely worth it. It was something that was completely new to me, but you know, uh, fascinating. And ever since then I've, you know, been into MMOs. It was that was the gateway drug for me, you know, going in from FF11 and then trying, you know, some of the Western MMOs as well, getting into World of Warcraft, seeing the differences um, mm -hmm. between the two. Personally, I think it's very different. I mean, here in Japan from the Western market because, yeah, it is for everyone it, uh, in the globe. I mean, it's very first uh, MMORPG on the console, PlayStation 2, and also, I mean, it was the first ever cross-platform MMO between PlayStation 2 and uh, Xbox 360. Mm. The obvious Ooh. one is the most Japanese people don't really like to speak, I mean, chat in public. Right. Uh -huh. So, I mean, in the world, there's a lot of characters, but it's very quiet because people are telling, using a, a tell <laughs> instead of a say or shout. And then That's so funny. I'm the so, so the opposite of that. I'm saying all of the crazy things that probably should be in a tell to everyone who's around me. <laughs>
It's so funny that you can see the difference, of course, between the Eastern and Western. Yeah, dial-up MMO. That's so insane. Oh my gosh. 11 was brutal, even for its era. Shout chat. Crystal Mommy, shout chat. But if you want, if you go to the Western world, game world, I mean, everyone, every single one is shouting yeah. around it. So yeah, that's a huge difference. <laughs> <laughs> you know, while in the West, you know, you have your EverQuests and you had your Ultima Onlines. In Japan, there was none of that. And then, so Final Fantasy XI was really one of the first mm. uh, MMOs in Japan. And so getting to work with basically the pioneers of the Japanese MMO um, was really exciting. On the other hand, I mean, you could also say that it was possibly kind of a curse in mm. the sense that um, they were all, you know, doing their own thing. They had their vision of what an MMO should be and what a Japanese MMO should be. Um, and then me, again, not having played an MMO before, getting on this team and thinking, okay, this is an MMO and translating away and working in that project, I kind of, you know, started thinking, okay, this is what an MMO is, this is what an MMO is. And then that one day I start playing, wow, and it's like, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Seeing the differences between the two and saying like, okay, what I thought was the norm in Final Fantasy XI, you know, the grinding for 20 hours to go up one level and then only to have your level drop when you, you know, pull too many crabs and it kills you and not you've normal. lost five hours work. Oh I thought that was God. normal. And then like, no. that's not normal, is it? The Japanese. <laughs> so that's a Japanese thing to grind so much in MMOs. Why? Why? <laughs> Why do they do this to us? Guess maybe that's why it changed after a Realm Reborn. <laughs> we love grinding. Asian thing. Why? Is okay, is there anyone here who is Asian who can explain why grinding is part of the MMO culture in Asia? Does it correlate to an Asian cultural thing? Like I just, I don't want to make any assumptions here. <laughs> Just, I don't understand. I guess Americans, we um, like immediate gratification. I feel like that's an American or a Western thing in general, you know? Immediate gratification, time reward thing. Yeah, old school MMOs are just grinding heavy. Nothing wrong with grinding with the boys on a Saturday night. <laughs> base game Final Fantasy XI had already released and they were working on the first expansion pack uh, Rise of the Zalart. I was part of the team that was working to get um, the base game and Rise of Zalart all translated before the Japanese Rise of Zalart was finished so we could all release at the same time. Right. Did you get it on time? I got it on time. I haven't missed, I haven't missed a deadline yet. That's, that's <laughs> one thing I'm proud of. Oh, Final yay. Fantasy XI was a huge success for Square <laughs> Enix. It established a concurrent user base of around a quarter of a million players for years. It was the most profitable Final Fantasy game ever, and at one stage was the mm. sixth most popular game on all of Xbox Live. More than that, it established the Japanese style of MMO. And when the decision was made in 2005 to start work on a sequel, the new MMO was built around things that made Eleven successful, focusing, like most Final Fantasy games do, on beautiful graphics and an interesting battle system. This new game was to be directed and produced by the same duo that shipped Eleven, series veteran Hiromishi Tanaka and Nobuaki Komodo. Final Fantasy XIV was announced for Windows and PlayStation 3 in 2009, but behind the scenes, the development team was struggling to put the pieces of its new world together. Oh. で、
とゲーム実装の大半がスクリプトで組まれてたんですね。でそのスクリプト UI の問題もそうなんですけれどもゲームも UI も基本的にはスクリプトで書かれていてでスクリプトを動かすエンジン側がかなりと負荷が高いというか、うん、CPU をたくさん使わないと動かない状態になっているので、まあ、ち,ょっとちょっとした何かをするだけでもゲーム内で少し何かをするだけでも非常に CPU リソースを使っていることになっていて、まあ、すぐにこうサーバーが回るサイクルが遅くなっていくということが問題として発生しています。で結果としてそのサーバーでできることは少ないあとゲームとしてサーバーで実現できるところは少ないですしと何かしようとすると負荷が上がっちゃうんでじゃあそれを回避するためにどうしようとかっていうことで、うん、結果的にそのゲーム内容としてリッチなものが実現できなくなっているってことが起きましたねで UI もスクリプトで組まれていたので、まあ、なんかちょっと処理するだけでもすごい時間がかかるっていうような問題が発生していました。Like I mentioned before, again, localization being in a position where we get to see all the parts come together first. We were some of the first to realize that, you know, Houston, we have a problem,、uh, that type of situation. I mean, you know, you had the battle team, they're like, yes, we have this great battle system, you know, with stamina and these things that you can do. And then you had the story team, yes, we have this story. Oh, hey, we have these guild leaves and all of these parts. And everyone was really, really proud of their parts, you know. Look at this grass, it's so beautiful. Look at this barrel, it's the You know, the most beautiful barrel ever to be, you know, <laughs> represented in graphical form. Perfect barrel. It's got、and、as many polygons as the character. <laughs> yes. And all of those parts, you know, all of these teams, again, very, very proud of, of their work. I mean, you have the team was, you know, put together、um, with some of the best minds in Square Enix. You had people that were, you know, leads that could probably even, you know, create, lead their own projects, were all come together.、Mm-hmm. and It became a lot of just tiny little groups making something that was really great. But once you put it together, it was kind、mm-hmm. of a mess. And no one really knew that except for localization and probably QA as well. And we we're like, okay, we need to do something. But by then, it was one of those, it's kind of too late to do anything. But for us, we would、uh, be looking at the text, and some of it, you know, it wouldn't make sense or it would just be very bland. And thinking, if there's any way to make this game better, what can we do? It's like, well, I can take this text and maybe add some more stuff into it, add some more flavor to it, and you know, maybe that will、uh, distract people from the fact that the battle <laughs> is not that fun. <laughs> At a fundamental level, the piecemeal design of the game was causing problems. <clears throat> Graphics were inconsistent. While many elements of the world were copy and pasted ad nauseum, some environmental objects had as many polygons and shaders as a character model. The battle、yeah. system was just confusing. The game didn't have elements fundamental to most modern MMOs. Things like jumping, auto attack, and the ability <gasps> to interact、no、with the map using a mouse. It had a system that nerfed hardcore players to make sure they didn't level up too fast. The UI was confusing, crafting was incredibly complex and took forever, and simply there just wasn't enough content. The closed <laughs> beta wasn't going well. They needed more time to fix these problems, so the open beta was pushed back to within a month before launch. The team knew there were problems. And they were getting frustrated. で、まあ、今,今まで話していた仕事っていうのは大体その2010年の1月から、まあ、実際にリリースされる 8, 8月ぐらいまでの間になっていたことで,で、まあ、ゲームが本当によ,よくないっていうのがこう、まあ、みんなに認識されて自覚さ,されていくっていうのはベータが始まって製品版が始まってっていう、まあ、8月9月10月ぐらいまでの期間に。起きたことなんですね、うん、でと実際にはリリこうチーム内の意識としてもとリリース前そのベータが始まる前からと本当にこれをリリースしていいものかどうかっていう議論はある程度そのチーム全体でオフ,そのオフィシャルであったわけではないですけれども、まあ、開発者の中ではやはりそのと世に出していいクオリティかどうかっていうところはと議論がありました。When 1.0 was getting made. Was it just was the mentality that, oh, we're not like, that's like their thing, and we have our very own successful thing over here, we're going to just make another one of those? Right. And、uh, that's really what it felt like is that we're going to continue doing what we did because it succeeded before.、Mm. Why wouldn't it succeed again? And seeing that direction, you know, them taking that direction, and knowing that, you know, having worked on Eleven, that yes, they were very successful, seeing the success that they had with. Final Fantasy XI, seeing these great creators you know, creating something that was, I mean, revolutionary.、Um, 
But then on the other hand, knowing that what they were doing was, yeah, but maybe that might not, that worked six or seven years ago, but a lot of things have changed since then. And I mean, I think there was even one guy on the localization team uh, that got to that point where he just got so frustrated that he just wrote this scathing mail <laughs> and sent it out to the whole team before telling anyone else on localization he was going to write it. And then we all get it at the same time that the dev team, we're reading, it's like, wow, this is really terrible. I hope he doesn't, oh, he sent it to the whole team. <laughs> That's a big deal in Japanese culture to write a scathing email. That guy was me. <laughs> Darth, it was you. <laughs> He had to be really unhappy to do that. <laughs> because he just got really frustrated because he could, to him, I mean, they were being very stubborn. They weren't, um, you know, they hadn't moved on. Whereas the rest of the world had moved on and, and adapted, um, you know, with the release of WoW and, and what they had done. Whereas, you know, the team here was like, no, we're going to stick with what we know. And that's good enough. Then start feeling more about more concerning the situation. I mean, this is not fixed, not fixed, not fixed. Oh, then, oh, you announced the launch date, but it's not fixed. So, yeah, but still, the some major portion of people are still thinking, still be, uh, believing. No, 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 it's it's better, still better. Mm -hmm. phase, last phase, but still better. So it could be, I mean, uh, fixed or the change that the launch timing. Is. Kind of went from thinking, okay, this project's gonna be great, to, uh-oh, there might be some problems. Can we get, can we fix them? Can we fix them? Okay, we can't fix them. Mm. Is there anything we can do? Uh, I don't know. It was, yeah, it was a very taxing experience. Mm. Wow. The team crossed their fingers and hoped that the game's beta problems <laughs> were simply that, the same issues that most MMOs have, ones that could be fixed with patches once the game entered live operations. And so Final Fantasy XIV Online launched on September 30th, 2010. It sold well its first week and after a month had over 600,000 players swarming into its world. But it didn't take long for the cracks to appear. The problems in the beta were echoed by new players. The game was sluggish, the servers crashed, and Eorzeans quickly ran out of things to do. Quests were limited and the fatigue system even made grinding for XP next to impossible. Critics hmm. ate it alive too. Let's get right down to it. Unless no, you've got yeah. the patience of Job or some kind of masochist, you shouldn't <laughs> play Final Fantasy XIV. Its problems are so vast that I could spend hours <laughs> talking about them. The Joke. awful interface, the recycled content, the stringent limits on questing, the useless maps, the stupid market ward, these issues and dozens more constantly have you asking that age-old question, what were they thinking? Oh no. Damn. So what was it like seeing public reaction? Yeah, it was, it was very, I mean, very disheartening um, because you know, you'd want to you'd want to look at those and you'd want to say, no, no, they don't understand. They don't know, you know, what's going on here, or, or you know, but deep down, you'd know they were right, and that was what kind of you know that dagger in your heart and it's twisting because you know you want to defend what you worked on. I mean, the people that I worked with are the greatest people. That, I mean, I still you know work with a lot of them. I had worked with them before in FF11. I consider them not only coworkers but friends, um, but. You know, and then you see people on, online, you know, bashing the work they did. And I know how hard they worked. I know how many hours they put. And I know that like in the last three or four months, people were basically living um, at work, all, all putting their 100% into this. Oh my gosh, kind of related note. Okay, so I really want to get a Chocobo plush toy. And I went on Square Enix's site and looked at the corduroy plush toy. And you can pre-order it, but it's not available until September 2024? Is that normal? That it would take that long? I don't want to wait until September. What? Yeah, go look on the site right now. That's crazy. I mean, maybe they sold out of the first release, and so they need to make... Welcome to Square's pre-orders. They have a big, and that's normal. You might not even want it by then. I wait for everything. Oh God. I don't like waiting. <laughs> oh man. Why? They've already got such a cute little product photo of it. Why can't they release it next month? 
Right. Plus she's into your contract. Well, they have given me, that's actually not a bad idea. I could ask when I'm there because they've given me, usually during the Eorzean Symphony or Fan Fest, they'll give me the merch that they sell at Fan Fest within reason, you know, um, t-shirts and like bags. And at the Eorzean Symphony last year, they had little Moogle plush toys. Um, that was before I knew what Moogles were, but they're little, that it was, uh, like a, a little keychain Moogle, you know, but I want to, I want the plushie. <laughs> I'll ask, <laughs> I'll ask when I'm there. It's a game that was, you know, destined to <laughs> kind of crash and burn, but, and then to have people online just say, oh, that sucks. This person is a piece of shit and their work is terrible. It. It hurts. Oh yeah, the fat cat. When do I meet the fat cat? <clears throat> I saw him on Amazon. I could put I could put that in my Amazon wish list. A fat cat. That'd be fun. <clears throat> but it hurts more because if I was not here and was a user and had played that game, I probably would have said the same thing. So thisで、まあ、あの、オペレーション上のね、トラブルとかっていろいろタップがあるっていう。まあ、これあの、ある程度付き問題で、ま、大変だったんですけれども、それはあったんですけど、ゲーム内容に関して言うと、非常にま、評価され
fail. Today, Must Square Enix over. is based across multiple floors in a modern office complex in Shinjuku, Tokyo. It's a company that is often designing multiple projects at once. And while Final Fantasy XIV was being developed, in another part of the building, a different game was being made. Produced by a Final Fantasy fan, his name, Naoki Yoshida. Hmm. He looks so cool. Like his hairstyle like that. Like his hairstyle like that. He is... That took a second. He really is an accessory king, isn't he? Look at that sweater and the necklace. What? What is that? A unicorn? He's got like 17 different rings on and I really like his hair like this. Wow. When was this made? This is so great. Infinity Stones. He's very decked out. The necklace. Yeah, I'm really here for the necklace. For every award, 14 wins, Yoshi mints another ring. <laughs> we don't talk about the necklace, but tell me what's the necklace? What is the necklace? House four temps? I don't know what that means. You, you understand that you have to explain everything to me, right? Oh, it's a spoiler. Okay, don't explain it then. Just kidding. Don't explain it. I won't look at it. It just looks like a unicorn. It's a unicorn. He likes unicorns. Fair enough. Quest あの、like most Japanese players at the time, Yoshida-san played all the early Final Fantasy games. He holds them in high regard, though he still holds the bitter memory of not being able to save before the last dungeon in Final Fantasy III. But when he was 11 years old, a brand new type of gaming experience arrived at home. His uncle gave him a PC. On this PC, the young gamer learned how to program BASIC. His first video game centered around trying to break into a bank vault. <laughs> but this PC also exposed him to a spectrum of gaming. Break into the bank vault to get more rings. I understand his motives now. That eluded most Japanese players. Western role-playing games. He fell in love with games like Diablo and was stunned when he first went online and played with other players. で、遊ぶっていうのがもうとてつもないまた衝撃でしたね。まあ、ウルティマはもう本当に自由度のウルティマオンラインは特に、とにかく初期は自由度がめちゃくちゃ高いゲームだったので、その、いわゆるロードの
Thank you. その頃からコンソールと同じぐらいの比重で PC でゲームをかなり遊ぶようになってたので自分で PC パーツ買ってきて組み立てたりしてたしでやっぱりそのあたりで FPS もかなりプレイし始めてたし特に 3DMMO のスタートであるエバークエストその後プレイをし始めて当時エバ,エバークエストのパッケージを日本で手に入れるのが本当に大変で、うん、出張で東京に来た時に秋葉原をね時間を作ってゾンビのように店をこううろうろして<笑>エバークエストってゲームないですかエバークエストってないですかって。But then, I mean, that, those games would have been in English. So he was playing EverQuest in English. Yoshida san would embark on a career in games that would eventually see him joining Square Enix to work on the Dragon Quest series. Though he wasn't working on the Final Fantasy team, he was part of the Umbrella Group that was allocating programmers to various projects. He didn't have granular visibility on FF14, but he knew the team was struggling. I asked from his perspective as a producer where he thought the game's problems were coming from. I don't know, this is cut by the way, but Crystal Tools is called Middleware. I was trying to create the 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 middleware. になってしまったのでどのプロジェクトもものすごい大変な時期だったまあオリジナルの14がああなったってしまった理由の一つでもあるかなとは思いますさらに二つ大きな問題がそこに絡まっていてスクエアニックスその全体にプレイステーション2のジェネレーションで本当に世界一クオリティグラフィックスのクオリティが高いそしてゲームエクスペリエンスがものすごく詰まったゲームというのをたくさんリリースしたので本当にこうなんて言うんだろうある意味自信過剰にもうなっていた時期で自分たちが世界一だし自分たちのグラフィックスこそが世界一だしその作り方はその自分たちにしかできない。だからなんだろうでも超巨大な成功体験ってやっぱり足かせというかにもなる例だと思うんですけど Yeah, dude, I feel that I mean, I haven't been in this position but think of bands when they make a killer album back in the day when people used to buy albums and listen to albums you know, and you had this album that was just maybe even it was the band's debut album and, and then you're forced to follow that up with something just as good and how how do you reinvent the wheel you know you can't just make a copy of the thing you did before you have to say something different and you have to one up yourself from the last thing that had huge success and anytime you come out with a follow-up the critics are going to be ready to strike you down It's just inevitable, you know. It's really hard to follow something up that is so successful the first time. I think of Jeff Buckley because he's my fave,、um, and you know he only had his album Grace, and it became a lot more successful in Europe and France than it was in America. But it was it was very very successful, and of course fans were begging for a follow up album and. He really struggled. He really struggled with coming up with something to follow that because that was really like a magnum opus. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he felt that he had nothing else to say because he said it all. He pretty much did, you know? And, and he was. He was trying to write a second album and, and he had to leave New York when he was done touring the album. He went to Tennessee. He bought this house in Tennessee all by himself. And he was. Coming up with songs and creating demos, and it took him a few years, and then finally he felt like he had what he wanted for a second album. And his band was flying over to,、um, to come listen to the demos, and Jeff Buckley drowned. Crazy. How do you, how do you follow that up? You know, it's wild. So I give props. <laughs> 
to Square Enix for trying to follow up something that was so successful. It's wild. It's hard. It's tough. Yeah. If you don't know Jeff Buckley's story, I can tell you everything about it. <laughs> I know everything about him. The struggle is real. This TED Talk is amazing about your success in the creative genius and how to follow up. Oh, cool. Maybe we can do a react to that at some point. Zella Sauls, maybe you can put that in a, in a react thread. React request thread. The Weezer Rivers Cuomo Express, you had a problem with the Blue Album. Love that we are linking TED Talks. <laughs> yeah, we got good stuff in here, friends. Good stuff. Drop it in stream thingies. You have a friend who created what he considered his creative masterwork and it was stolen during transport. He's finding it so hard to recreate it. Oh my God, that's awful. <gasps> Damn. Oh, that's so bad. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Ugh. It's hard. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. We got to watch that TED talk. まあ、悪い方をすれば奢ってた時期だったと思うんですね。まず例えるとその刀を作る東証のような職人たちが本当にたくさんいて彼らが一つずつを手作りで作ってあの世界一のクオリティを作り上げていたんだけど実は世界は
世界最大の MMORPG は何ですかって言ったら100人に聞いたら100人がワールド・オブ・ウォークラフトって言ったはずなのに誰もプレイしてない開発チームがこれはワールド・オブ・ウォークラフトを知ってるか知ってないかっていう話だけの話をしてるんじゃなくてその自分たちが世の中に対して新しいそのビデオゲームをリリースしようとするときにライバルになるタイトルは何だろうとかユーザーは今プレイヤーはどこにそのゲームエクスペリエンスの最大最新の状態をプレイしてるんだろうっていうのを知らないっていうのがその感覚として僕には結構信じられないなんでもっとみんなゲームプレイしないのだって自分たちが今ど,どの辺りにいるか分かんなくなっちゃうよっていうのがまあ言いたいで特に14の場合に関してはもちろん「ファイナルファンタジー11」の超巨大な成功体験っていうのが邪魔をしたっていうのもあるとは思うんだけどあの当時はエヴァークエストを徹底的にプレイをしてだからこそ「11」を作ったはずなのに新しいレストランをオープンするときに隣にあるレストランがどんなメニューを出していてどんなサービスをしてるかを知らずにレストランを作る回転させる人はいないんじゃないって。Um, so, just at the, the launch stage then of, of 1.0, what was the feeling within Square Enix? The beta was quite close to launch. Were people anticipating that there would be negative feedback, or were they less aware that that was going to happen? I guess. I was in the other team, and the beta was very bad. I was in the internet, and I was in the internet. オーカレ少なかれ MMORPG のローンチは絶対にまあ荒れやすいそうサーバーがすぐ落ちるとかまあテストストレステストをやってるけどプレイヤーの方は遊びたいからやっぱりサーバーが落ちるとやっぱりすごく文句を言って当然だと思いますしだから僕もやっぱり11を作ったチームだからまあそうは言っても11のやっぱり完成度が高いのでそこと比較をして。あの機能がないこの機能がないっていう話をしてるのかなっていうふうに思ってた僕は僕自身の開発が忙しかったのもあってただそれもあの少しずつ収まっていくんだろうなっていうふうに僕は当時は見てたただ別の角度今度はそのオリジナルの14チームの中の,その視点としてはこのままだと本当にまずい<笑>もっと時間をかけて品質を上げないと。っていうもちろん声を上げる人たちもいたけれど会社ってまあ全体の判断としては「ファイナルファンタジー11」のスタートもそうだったと機能たくさんなかったしものすごくネガティブなフィードバックもたくさん来たけどパッチでどんどん直していって「11」は完成したんだから「14も大丈夫だと最初は絶対こうなんだっていうふうに判断したのでベータを終わらせて。リリース踏み切ったっていうのが当時のジャッジだったって僕はチームに入ってからインタビューをしてそれを確認したのでチームの中ではやっぱり議論はあったそうですあのままじゃダメまずいっていう話はただ最終的にジャッジは今お話しした通り11の時もそうだったでも11だってずっとパッチを続けてああなったじゃないかと Eventually corporate realized that this wasn't usual launch problems, so they called on a few select members of the team to create a task force. This task force would research what changes the game needed and the resources the development environment would require to do the work. Members of that team would talk to Yoshida-san about their worries after hours. His thoughts were that the current organizational structure would need to be modified if the team was going to make the changes required. In October of 2010, Yoshida-san talked to the then Square Enix president Yoichi Wada and suggested they initiate a company-wide emergency to get the team the resources they needed. Wada-san spent a few days talking to the 14 development team about their concerns, and while a lot of the team had suggested that the current task force was in fact up to the task, Some members of the 14 team had pleaded to have Yoshida-san join the project to help. And so it transpired that in late November, corporate took the decision to remove Hiromishi Tanaka from the team and move Nobuaki Komodo from director to lead designer. Both of their vacant positions would be filled by Yoshida-san. Wow. At that time, he was leading a team that was working on an original IP for Square Enix. He was disappointed to leave that team, but excited for the opportunity to work on one of the company's crown jewels, a numbered Final Fantasy game. So, he got right to it. That's amazing that he took the place of 
two people. <laughs> That's wild. Um, I said that away. I'm just going to check my messages here. やらなきゃいけないことは当時というか、ま、顔と名前ぐらいは知ってるスタッフはいたけど、その一緒に仕事したことがある人がほとんどいなかったので、まずセイハローっていうところから。で、一度はみんな仕事したことがないから、どんな仕事をする人間なのかを見て
to do research playing other MMOs and to help draft his plan to deliver the vision and how the team was going to do it. They had very little time to fix this game, so once they started, the specifications document would have to be watertight. And as captain of the ship, he needed to be able to answer every question the team may have quickly. Yoshida-san was now at the helm of his first Final Fantasy, and as an avid MMO fan, he was looking forward to getting in there and fixing it. What he couldn't have known at this stage was the scale of the job ahead of him, that no matter how much they patched Final Fantasy XIV online, they couldn't ever fix it. What they have to do was something that no developer had ever done, to rebuild an entire MMO while the original version was still running. I don't think that they realized immediately that it was something that couldn't be solved via patches. I think they still believe that, you know, if we patch it, it'll be fine. Um, and it wasn't until they reevaluated and then brought in, you know, the new blood. Yoshisan came in and told them, okay, yeah, this is not something that can be patched. If we want to fix this, we're going to have to take a drastic step. Yoshida spent seven weeks researching and returned with two options for corporate. It was then he realized that it would be impossible to convert okay, the current you. game into an MMO that can Okay, so I'll pause for a second because um, I'm a little distracted since we're also trying to figure out the sub point thing. So we found the sub points. We needed more sub points than I thought we needed. <laughs> like a lot more. Sub points are, are really hard to get. We don't know if it updates live. Oh, it does not update live. Sub points does not update live. Chandra just found, um, so, so how many that we have here, hold on. Let me just crunch, crunch numbers about <laughs> this is, um, yeah, it doesn't. Oh, Ponto's back. Yeah, Ponto, we were trying to figure out. It's so hard to find out where the frickin' sub points go. It's absolutely insane. Um, so hard to find. Um, Chandra's gonna number crunch. Maybe, Chandra, can you be the official counter downer and tell the people where we're at? Um, it's, it's a little bit more than I thought. And remember, I'm just gonna repeat myself that if you get a gifted sub, which is wonderful. I'm so grateful for any subs, even gifted subs. You can convert, I mean, definitely gifted subs. They unfortunately don't count as sub points for Partner Plus, but if you were given a gifted sub, you can convert that to tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one is one point, tier two is two points, tier three is six points. So if you were to convert a tier one sub, that goes towards the sub points. And Chandra will crunch numbers or, or someone potentially can crunch numbers that isn't Chandra. <laughs> it's so hard to find. Even, and I even put a sub point goal counter and it's not counting sub points. It's just, Twitch makes it really hard to figure out how many sub points you have. Probably because they don't want you making 70%. That's why. <laughs> Everyone needs to be a tier three. If you could do tier three for one month, we would get there so fast. I know that's a lot. I know that's asking a lot, but um, if you, if you have the goodness in your heart <laughs> and you want to, that would make it go a long way. Um, so anyway, Chandra's crunching numbers and, and she can tell you where we're at with that. Tier three is, is not three months. Tier three is, um, you're still getting it for one month. It's just basically you're giving the streamer more money. <laughs> That's what a tier three is. Three months in a row to qualify. Oh, I thought it was. Okay, Ponto knows better. I still am very confused by all this stuff. Ponto can answer all of our questions. <laughs> you gotta have 350 PP points for three months. Oh, exactly, yes. So this would qualify me for the first month of Partner Plus. And this is the most sub points I've ever had, which is why I've been trying to make this push here at the end of the month. So stick around, people. <laughs> Correct. All right. Twitch is so confusing. It's so confusing. I agree. I agree. I'm so confused. All right. Keep it could last the test of time. Ultimately, oh though, this I'm was a decision that corporate had to make. So he returned with not one, but two plans. Plan A and Plan B. During this meeting, he explained that Plan A would be to patch the game and make it more playable, but that ultimately the game would never really satisfy players, and though Square Enix may make their money back, the 
225 of 350. Right? We need 350, not 250. Sorry, I'm distracted by this. I'm not paying as close attention as I need to be. So we're at we're at 225 of 350. That's where we're at with the sub points right now. So how many does that mean? 125. <laughs> we need 125 sub points. <laughs> 125 sub points. <laughs> ah! It's so hard. Oh man. Tree fitty. Yeah, bro, tree fitty. <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. Let's keep watching this. Damage to the online brand would be catastrophic. And then there was plan B. Final Fantasy original Final Fantasy XIV. Final Fantasy XIV. で、まあ、その、その話だけを聞くと、まあ、そんなバカなってなるので、当然どうやってそれを達成するか。チームを 2 2012年年末から2013年12年は絶対リリースできる。この計画であればっていうプレゼンテーションをしてリスクは高い。ただ当然そんなことをしたことはないし、ゲーム業界で。しかも同じタイトルで作り直してるから成功うまくいったとしても成